Good afternoon and welcome to this first event from the Waterloo Global Science Initiative, the Equinox Summit, Energy 2030. My name is John Matlock, WGSI Executive Producer and Director of External Relations and Public Affairs here at Perimeter Institute for Theoretical Physics. This is Julie Wright, your WGSI coordinator who's been busy working behind the scenes this last year. She will be our fellow master of ceremonies today and is your moderator for the public lectures in the days ahead. WGSI is coming to you live in theatre and online in partnership with TVO. We're here in Waterloo, Ontario, Canada, where our intention over the next few days is to help reboot the global dialogue on energy, particularly the growing need for electricity. The summit will do so by benchmarking our capabilities to provide electricity, showing present and future needs, examining scientific and technological ideas with potential for transformative change, and shortlisting some of the best approaches and implementation strategies if we're to realize a cleaner and more electrified future. There are many steps involved over the days ahead. So today's opening event will introduce us to the work and help explain a bit more about WGSI itself. We will note special guests and summit participants. Listen to opening remarks from the WGSI Chair, Vice Chair, and Summit Patron, as well as comments from the Chief Executive of TVO, the Summit's presenting media partner. And we will begin to investigate energy issues with our Summit moderator, Wilson De Silva. This will include the world premiere of the Equinox Summit benchmark videos, plus a panel discussion. But first, ladies and gentlemen, would you please rise for the arrival of His Excellency, the Right Honourable David Johnson, Governor General of Canada. Mesdames et Messieurs, voulez-vous lever, s'il vous plaît, pour l'arrivée de Son Excellence, le très honorable David Johnson, Governor General du Canada. Welcome, Your Excellency. Other guests in attendance today include Senator Elaine McCoy from the Parliament of Canada, the Honorable Gary Goodyear, Canada's Minister of State for Science and Technology, the Honorable John Malloy, Ontario's Minister for Training, Colleges and Universities, Peter Braid, Member of Parliament for Kitchener-Waterloo, Leanna Pendergast, MPP for Kitchener-Conestoga, Chair Ken Sealing of the Region of Waterloo, ambassadors and consul generals from Canada, Germany, Brazil, and Italy. Several industry leaders here today. WGSI board members, including Arthur Carty, Tom Burstowski, and Michael Duchenne. And members of the WGSI Advisory Council, including Mike Lazaridis and Cal Stiller. And our partners from TVO, including Peter O'Brien, Lisa DeWild, Steve Pakin, Nancy Chappelle, Dan Dunsky, and many others. Welcome all. At the heart of the Equinox Summit are three very important groups of people who will collaborate on technological approaches and implementation strategies to realize a more electrified future. Let us meet them right now. Our quorum of scientific experts who will envision future technologies are Alain Asperu Guzik of Harvard University, Craig Dunn of Borealis Geopower, Kathy Foley of CSIRO, Australia's National Science Agency. Yasin Kadi of CERN. Linda Nazar of the University of Waterloo. Ted Sargent of the University of Toronto. Maria Skillis Kazakos of the University of New South Wales. And joining us later will be Bill Rose Hart of the University of Calgary and Jillian Buryak of the University of Alberta. Our forum of future leaders from around the world will craft implementation steps in the days ahead. They are Esther Adediji, Zoe Karen, 
sorry, uh, Esther Adediji is from Nigeria. Zoe Karen is of Canada. Will Catton of New Zealand. Carrie Chung of the United States. Philippe de Leon of Costa Rica. Leah Demange of Brazil. Ding Ding of China. Aaron Leopold from the United States. Mark MacArthur of Canada. Jacob Nygaard of Denmark. Lauren Riga of the United States. Vajish Sharma of India. Gita Siravani of Indonesia. Ted Shirk from Canada. Jose Maria Valenzuela of Mexico. Weiwei of China. And Arthur Yip from Canada. Helping both groups on the research and development and implementation plans will be the summit advisors. They include Jay Aft of Carnegie Mellon, Jason Blackstock of the Center for International Governance and Innovation, Nick Parker of Cleantech, Marlo Reynolds, Senior Advisor to Pembina, Barry Brook, the University of Adelaide, Walt Patterson of Chatham House, Robin Batterham, former Chief Scientist of Australia, the University of Melbourne, and Jatin Natwani of Waterloo Institute for Sustainable Energy. And joining us later will be David Reynolds of the Centre for International Governance and Innovation, Tom Rand, venture capitalist and author, rather Tom is here actually, if Tom could stand, thanks, venture capitalist and author, and Velma McCall, who is principal of Ernst Cliff Strategy Group. Three distinguished speakers will also join us this week for our 4 p.m. lectures. On Monday, we'll have Vaslav Smil of the University of Manitoba, Thomas Homer Dixon of the University of Waterloo, and David Keith at the University of Calgary. So if you're not able to actually make those lectures, please make sure to tune in online at tvo.org or wgsi.org, and you can watch them live. Ladies and gentlemen, these are the summit participants who will be collaborating on your energy future. And now to begin our main event uh, and provide the big picture on WGSI, please welcome the chair of the Waterloo Global Science Initiative, Dr. Neil Turok, director of Perimeter Institute for Theoretical Physics, and the vice chair of WGSI, Dr. Farrandon Hamdalopper, President and Vice Chancellor of the University of Waterloo. Thank you very much, John and Lisa. Uh, it's my pleasure to wish you all a very warm welcome to Perimeter Institute and to Waterloo. Waterloo is a very special community with a strong focus on science and its future uses. And WGSI is a new partnership between Perimeter Institute, the University of Waterloo, and the province of Ontario. The plan is to hold events which highlight major challenges for humanity and, and how science and technology can be used to meet them. Our prosperity today is based on yesterday's scientific discoveries. Tomorrow, our very survival will likely depend on equally big breakthroughs and time is limited. Discoveries made over the next two or three decades may well be critical for the future of our quality of life and for the sustainability of our planet. WGSI brings together outstanding international experts and young leaders to focus on one key topic and to make specific recommendations. We want it to be much more than a conference. We want it to have a real impact accelerating ideas that take root in the coming decades. Perimeter Institute for Theoretical Physics is contributing its organizational experience in research, training, and educational outreach. Our facility, including the new Stephen Hawking Center next door, has been designed to foster collaboration and for events like this that connect people in science, education, government, industry, the media, and beyond. We're extremely pleased to be hosting this first Equinox Summit. We wish the participants a productive week ahead, 
and we look forward to seeing the outcomes. Nous sommes donc très fiers d'accueillir ce premier sommet. Nous souhaitons à tous les participants une semaine très productive. Et nous attendons avec intérêt vos résultats. Merci. Good afternoon, everyone. On behalf of the University of Waterloo and my colleagues here at the Perimeter Institute, it's a great pleasure to help launch this first Equinox Summit. The Waterloo Global Science Initiative is another chapter in an unfolding history of partnership between our organizations. We have collaborated, cl collaborated extensively on the creation of the Institute for Quantum Computing and the formation of Perimeter Scholars International, which have attracted some of the most talented researchers and brightest students in the world. This new WGSI partnership will propel a highly focused international conference every two years on topics that advance dialogue and catalyze the long-range thinking necessary to drive scientific and technological progress. It is important, however, that we work towards the how of solving problems, that we do not lose sight of the why. Why did Waterloo and Perimeter create the WGSI. We did so because we believe that understanding the issues and working towards addressing them is a shared responsibility. Energy is a global issue that requires a global approach. And Waterloo Region is the perfect venue for that conversation. We are already home to a critical mass of energy research expertise housed in our Waterloo Institute for Sustainable Energy and Waterloo Institute for Nanotechnology. Together, they present hundreds of researchers to enhance the capacity for sustainable energy research, dev development, and deployment through education, partnership, and commercialization. It is because we grasp fully the important challenges of energy and the environment that we have partnered with another innovative institution and research powerhouse, the Perimeter Institute, in order to make the strongest impact. Together and with your participation, we will help foster the innovative ideas and implementation steps that can advance electricity generation, delivery and storage systems as well as promote energy efficiency and environmental sustainability. And as we embark upon this global, global conversation, it is our great honor to welcome back a friend of Waterloo Region. Someone who has been instrumental in the success of both organizations and who, perhaps more than anyone, appreciates how ambitious the Waterloo Global Science Initiative is and how important this summit will be to our energy future. Je voudrais maintenant inviter son excellence le très honorable David Johnston à vous adresser la parole. Your Excellency. Thank you, Faridan. Uh, thank you, Neil. Mr. Chancellor Emeritus Mike, Excellency, members of the Diplomatic Car, Parliamentarians, uh, Waterloo Global Science Initiative board members and advisors, chers amis, let me begin by saying how glad I am to be here for the opening of this summit among so many friends and former colleagues. Quelle joie d'être parmi vous aujourd'hui pour l'ouverture de ce sommet. I must say that uh, I've looked forward to this with, with great anticipation and great delight. But as the day got a little closer, I began to get nervous because uh, I left this wonderful enterprise when the hard work began, um, a not uncommon feature, uh, and thought everything was fine. And then uh, Neil contacted me and said, uh, well, will you come and speak? I thought, well, I can't say no. And then what I'm going to say, I got a little nervous. When I got really nervous is I got a message that, well, don't make it too long, just be sure that it's short, warm, and inspiring. 
And I remember back to 1979, I was the very, very young principal vice chancellor of McGill University. I think I was two months into the job and we had the first of 15 years of consecutive budget cuts. And we put our think tank together as to how we're going to deal with this great dilemma. And one of the bright ideas that could only have happened in Quebec in 1979 when energy was treated very differently than it was today was that Quebec Hydro was offering substantial capital grants and some operating discounts if you would switch your non-electrical using appliances to electrical using appliances. So our bright idea was to replace all the paper hand drying machines in the washrooms of the university, thereby decimating the forest industry of Canada, and replace them with electrical hand drying machines. I issued the edict. It was actually carried out, strangely enough, and a week later I'm on an inspection tour, and the first building is the McConnell Engineering Building. I go into the men's washroom, and there is the electric hand drying machine right there, brand spanking white in my face, and already some graffiti has been inscribed. It, just above the depressor button, it says, press this button for a short, warm, inspiring message from your principal. <laughs> and my reaction was to turn 180 degrees, and lo and behold, on the other wall was a similar machine, also with gra graffiti, and it just shows how bilingual the McGill engineers were, because it read, poussez ce bouton, pour un message court, inspirant et chaleureux de votre Principal, merci. And I thought, isn't that wonderful? Our engineers are polite. They say thank you at the end. Mm -hmm. It was my privilege, as Neil and Faraday mentioned, during the wonderful years I was here as president of the University of Waterloo to have played a role in the launch of this exciting initiative. The aim was, and it remains, to take a long-term global view of some of the most pressing social, environmental, and economic issues of our time sort of one big package by one big package every two years, and to stimulate new ideas and solutions for the future, and then to challenge Ontarians and Canadians to participate in those solutions. And so it was both long-term, and it was intended to be a catalyst for people to take action and change their world. And so it was with great delight that I'm here to see this conference come to fruition, a conference which will be the beginning of many, and will help to establish a new pinnacle of excellence for Canada right here. Our subject is energy, perhaps the defining resource of our modern civilization. Everyone here would agree that our ability to solve the challenges associated with energy use and production will be critical to our future well-being in Canada and around the world. And that's why this gathering is so important. For inspiration, as we begin, we might draw on the words of Ken Dryden. I was thinking of Kenny last night as I watched that marvelous victory of the Vancouver Canucks in overtime, and, and I love the beautiful game of hockey. Um, and um, just like the, um, uh, the Vancouver Olympics helped to define uh, Canada as a game changer, and I think we're going to see the first Canadian Stanley Cup since 1993 uh, coming back uh, to this country. Uh, so I think this event is a, is a game changer, is an Olympics in its own way. In any event, Ken's latest book is called Becoming Canada, and he wrote of the need to think globally and to work together for a better future in these words. To think about Canada, we need to think about the world. And the world's future, it is clear, will depend on learning and getting along. And so to the theme of my speech today, the importance of learning, innovation, and the sharing of knowledge in Canada and around the world. As you know, one of my priorities as Governor General is to reinforce learning and innovation in this country. In 2017, we'll celebrate the 150th anniversary of Confederation, and I have taken this podium that is available to the Governor General to invite Canadians across the land to think about ways to build a smarter, more caring nation as we approach this wonderful milestone. And both adjectives are important, smarter, more caring nation. My installation speech added a little tag to that. I wouldn't be me if I didn't. It was a call to service. I believe that one of the best ways to build the smart and caring Canada of the future is to encourage a citizenry that values lifelong learning and innovation. It's part of the character of the people. A smart nation is one that learns from the past, embraces the future, and looks to the world with confidence and with respect. In the caring nation we envision, 
Excellence and equality of opportunity coexist. It's very interesting, those two concepts, equality of opportunity and excellence. This nation has worked very hard at equality of opportunity. I do not know of a nation that's worked harder than we have. It's our tradition. As Hugh McLennan once said, we're a nation of losers. He didn't mean that we were people who were bereft of spirit or character. He meant that almost all of us came from another land with no status, with no property, just with fierce determination that our children shall do better, that we will have a better time, that we will make the world better for our future. Yesterday in uh, Rideau Hall, I was taking a group of uh, school children through uh, the main gallery, and there are four William Kurlek paintings there on the wall. Kurlek was the Ukrainian-Canadian artist did prairie scenes. The first one is a village in the Ukraine in 1925, and it shows a little girl emerging from a hut with a begging bowl in her hand, barefoot out into the snow, age seven or eight, and her mother behind her opening the door with a tear coming down her face. And at the back of the village, you see soldiers rounding up all the adult males. That was Ukraine, 1925. The next picture shows that village, or the settlers, on a ship coming into Halifax Harbor, coming into Pier 21, which two days ago I visited, has welcomed 20% of the people to this country. And all they had were their one little valise bag behind each of them, backs to the old world, eyes to the new world, looking for a future that would be better. The third painting shows that same group on a Saskatchewan or Alberta farm with a forest here, some cleared land here, one of their predecessors with a couple axes in hand saying, go ahead, all I have to do is cut down the, the wood, start planting the field, and away you go. And 15 years later, the next painting shows a farmer in a wheat field, a section long, up to his ears in wheat, holding a handful of grain with his homestead over here. Found a place, found a job, built a community, better for the children. Of course, Curlick would not be Curlick without a, another sort of dark message, and up in the left-hand corner is a mushroom-shaped cloud, just reminding us that there are other clouds on the horizon as well. I've told that story so often about Canada and the equality of opportunity and giving people a chance to find a place, a space, and build better communities. But with equality of opportunity, where we are expanding the talents of our people to the utmost, we must also have excellence. And we must see that excellence not as a competing quality, but as a reinforcing quality, to take the talent to its highest level, to magnify it as widely as possible, and use that talent to stimulate increasing levels of aspiration to function as we did in the Vancouver 2010 Olympics with 14 gold medals. So citizens of a smart and caring nation work collaboratively. And I want to commend the participants and organizers of this conference for coming together this week for an entire week to discuss the future of energy. I can think of few ways in which our interdependence is more total, and I want to challenge all of you to continue to explore new avenues, not simply for the inspiration, but for the cooperation and collaboration so that we engage so many in this exercise. We're looking ahead to 2030. I know that an important part of the work here is to benchmark key aspects of our energy use and supply and to set targets for the future. And so as we approach Canada's 150 birthday celebration, in just a few short years, we must similarly ask ourselves, what are our goals? What are the mechanisms by which they can be reached? When I ask questions like this, I'm, I'm reminded of one of my favorite Einstein stories. In fact, I think it's my favorite Einstein story. Um, Einstein, after he fled Hitler and was established in the United States and was at the Institute for Advanced Study at Princeton, in many ways perimeter is modeled on that, was of the conviction that only if we could only popularize science, if only the populace at large understood better the gifts of science and the force that was needed to carry it forward, the world would be a much better place. So he went on a public speaking tour. And he was very popular, as you might expect, so much so that he hired a chauffeur. And uh, the chauffeur was driving him in from Princeton to New York on one occasion. And Einstein said to the chauffeur, I can't do this. This is the 37th night in a row that I've been in this car going off to give a lecture and I'm just worn out. I don't think I can perform tonight. The chauffeur says, look boss, I've heard you give that speech 250 times. I could give it in my sleep. No, 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 you couldn't give my speech. Boss, I assure you, I can give it. I will deliver it perfectly. You just sit at the back and rest and you can, you can understand that I will do it well. You really think you can? Yes. Einstein agreed come to the church basement, Einstein puts on the chauffeur's cap, sumps down in the back row, 
chauffeur comes up and he said, look, boss, I kind of look like you, and if I mess my hair up a little bit, I'm kind of short, dumpy, and they'll think I'm you. He gives a speech, and he gives it so well that he finishes about a minute and a half early, and the master of ceremony says, my, oh, my, we've got a minute and a half for a question. One question, please. Learned gentleman in the middle row gets up, a preamble and a question that just drives a coach in four through Einstein's theory of relativity. The chauffeur paused for a moment, and then he said, my good sir, that question is so elementary, I'm going to ask my chauffeur at the back of the room to answer it. <laughs> well, the moral of that story is, in a sense, we're all chauffeurs. I mean, we're, our job is to engage everyone in this effort of using knowledge for our great advantage. And I think, again, uh, our challenge here in Canada is to uh, popularize this message of science and technology so that all of us engaged are engaged in advancing our knowledge and using it to improve the human condition in a very collaborative way. And I hope that will be a goal for a smarter and more caring nation by, one, by 2017 in this country. So to all Canadians, I would say your talent, your ingenuity, your compassion are essential to our common future. Canada is blessed with a wealth of minerals, timber, fresh water, but our greatest resource by far is our collective ingenuity. Canadians have long been innovators, partly in response to the challenges posed by our vast geography. Think of railway building in the late 1800s, or the introduction of new communication technologies that followed. Or consider the more recent example of Waterloo's research in motion, which applied the laws of physics articulated in the 20th century, and just by better engineering of those laws, made great leaps forward in mobile communication technology. And of course, that's what motivated Mike to create this Institute of Theoretical Physics, to redefine the laws of physics that are unanswered from the theories of Einstein and Newton, other great giants, into the 21st century, particularly at the quantum level. And of course, that's what drove Cal Stiller with this idea of this conference. I remember the call from Cal, who was chairing the Ontario Innovation Trust. Cal, you'll remember it well. And he said, David, he said, you're a sport. You like athletics. Um, if you wanted, if you were the Minister of Amateur Sport for Ontario for Canada, and you wanted to engage the whole populace in sport because it's simply good for people to do, it's healthy, etc., wouldn't it be great to bring the Olympics every four years to Toronto or Ottawa, to some city here, and the épanouissement, the outflow of ideas that would come from that, would lift the culture for sport? He said, well, let's think of an Olympics of science and technology. And let's think of something that goes to the pinnacles of excellence and looking well ahead, 2030. And let's, because we're practical people, say, how do we use those pinnacles of excellence to drive the innovation agenda in Ontario and across the country? And from Cal's ideas and the Ontario Innovation Trust came this wonderful partnership with the Perimeter Institute of Theoretical Physics, the University of Waterloo, and the people of Waterloo who understand so well the importance of knowledge. And I love that sporting, an sporting analogy because just like the Vancouver 2010 Olympics was a game changer for Canada, the pinnacles of excellence, 14 gold medals, never achieved by any nation before, and we're a relatively small nation. A community effort right across the country. Remember that Olympic torch being carried village to village to village to build it? A great collaborative effort to carry off an Olympics that one has never seen before. So we need this kind of Olympics here every two years in the pinnacles of excellence in some area of science and then challenge the whole country to carry the torch, not just before the game, but after the game as well. Innovation, in essence, is about crafting new ideas to improve the way we do things. Crafting new ideas to improve the way we do things. A little different than invention. It's the step-by-step-by-step -step -step relentless improvement that is often a hundred steps or a hundred specific improvements that make things happen. It's about seeing things differently and imagining that which could be. There's nothing new about innovation and discovery. Indeed, they are as old as humanity itself. But what is new and unprecedented is the speed and scale of change in the world today. I'm often, I think the 16th century, the 15th century is my favorite century, favorite period in history in Western Europe, because that's where the printing press developed. And we moved from knowledge becoming a oral tradition, largely learned through obedience and by obeisance. Um, one's 
relationship with God was so important in the feudal ages of, the, of, of uh, Europe in the 15th century. What happened with the printed word is it permitted people to read about that relationship in their own language for themselves without the intermediaries of priests and bishops and popes and so on. And that liberating spirit, of course, and the new approach to knowledge that came from the written word, the word of the book, uh, permitted Western Europe, which was a backward civilization with respect to Islam, India, and China, to leap ahead. But it took over 300 years, over three centuries, for the printed word, the printing press, to reach a majority of the population. The internet has reached a majority of the world's population in less than a decade, and it covers the entire world. That's the wonderful revolution that we're, we're, we're harvesting now. We live in an era of profound globalization where the frontiers of knowledge have eclipsed those of land and sea as the outermost reaches of human endeavor. But far from abstract, these knowledge frontiers represent a new paradigm where our quality of life will be determined by our ability to think creatively and to solve problems. Simply put, our well-being will hinge upon our ability to innovate. And as I say that, I'm reminded of another of my favorite Einstein quotes who once said, for every complex problem, there is a simple and wrong solution. <laughs> History reminds us that successful societies are driven by innovation and that knowledge is the key to discovery. Again, going back to my favorite period, the 15th and 16th century, let's look at one of the most dynamic moments in the history of Western civilization. To a little town, it was Florence, 30 to 50,000 people in the 15th and 16th century. It was a period of creativity and intellectual ferment that led to incredible activity in the arts, sciences, sciences politics, religion, scholarship. Da Vinci in uh, engineering uh, and in painting, Michelangelo in painting and sculpture, Donatello, Machiavelli. Machiavelli wrote the first secular bestseller. The prince in 1523 was using the printed word for people no longer simply about their religious beliefs, the Bible, the Book of Common Prayer, etc., but about how power is acquired and gained. And that was a popular bestseller. Uh, the Medici family, the great banking fam family that produced the wealth that uh, permitted so many of these things to happen. The legacy is nothing if not mixed, because after all, these remarkable individuals were also products of their time, but they were also a cluster where excellence in one field rubbed off and excellence in another. And it was kind of a, a very propitious virus that was operating through that little town of 30 to 50,000 people on the rivers of the Arno uh, that made such a difference. Through the power of ideas, the people of Florence moved Europe out of the Middle Ages and into a new era, the Renaissance, where the best of classical antiquity, remember they started by looking backward to the knowledge we'd forgotten, and then developed the ability to project forward for advances in humanism and science. Leonardo was a very good example of that, went back to classical drawing, but also was sketching things like helicopters, uh, because he knew that if we could reinterpret those laws of physics, we could do great things. So we ask ourselves, what was that enabled this little Italian city-state of 50,000 people or so to achieve such remarkable heights. The reasons are many. The wealth of Florence as a merchant city was certainly part of it. Political independence and civic pride was certainly part of it. The existence of a large middle class with an aspiration to learn was a big part of it. Competition amongst artists and craftsmen. The widespread system of apprenticeship between generations. We would call these preconditions, prosperity, civil society, equality, competition, learning and the sharing of knowledge. And so this cluster of activity in the 15th century Florence brought these elements together with results that were innovative and sometimes surprising, and I hope a great precursor for what we see in this little region of Waterloo today. Let me give a, a very specific example that's less known perhaps than the, than the Michelangelo's or uh, the Leonardo's or the Machiavelli's or the Medici's. In his book, Brunel Shelley's Dome, art historian Ross King tells the story of the building of the great dome of Santa Maria del Fiore, completed in 1436. In designing this engineering marvel, the Florentine architect Filippo Brunel Shelley fused elements of classical design with innovations in science and technology and reinvented architecture in the process, the past and the future. That much is fairly well known. Less renowned is one of the unexpected side effects of Brunel Shelley's innovation, an advance in astronomy 
that had far-reaching applications for ocean navigation. Now just think of that jump, huh? From the architecture of the dome to ocean navigation. This development came about after Brunel Shelley's friend, the cluster effect, the contact business that comes from great people working together, the mathematician and astronomer Paolo Toscanelli, who climbed to the top of the great cathedral and placed a bronze plate at the top of the dome. As Ross King explains, Santa Maria del Fiore was thus transformed into a giant sundial. This instrument would prove vital to the history of astronomy. The height and stability of the dome allowed Toscanelli to gain a superior knowledge of what were then thought to be the sun's motions, which in turn enabled him to calculate with a much greater accuracy than anyone previously the exact moment of both the summer solstice and the vernal equinox." End of quote. I want to stop for a moment to consider this remarkable development, an entirely unanticipated spin-off of Brunel Shelley's great dome led to an advance in celestial navigation, which in turn allowed mariners and map makers to plot their positions more accurately, and bear in mind this is 1436, thanks to this innovation and many others like it, the great age of ocean navigation was about to begin. Well, let me end. My point in sharing this story is to emphasize the fruitful and often unexpected results of innovation and knowledge sharing, and particularly the cluster effect. One of the best ways to enhance knowledge is to share it, and new discoveries are seldom the work of an individual. One of my favorite metaphors is Jefferson's candle. Jefferson once said, if you light your unlit candle from my lit candle of knowledge, my light is not diminished, it's enhanced. With this in mind, I encourage you to continue to work together and to engage all parts of society to address the challenges we face and catalyze solutions for the future. Imagine it's now 2030 and the people of the world are thankful for this moment in time when you, the scientists, advisors, future leaders, gathered at this Equinox Summit to share strategies, to ponder new technologies, and explore big ideas. The world needs this summit. And your presence in this auditorium proves your belief in the power of collaboration. Let me applaud your efforts to envision our energy future. I look forward to reading your observations and seeing the outcomes of this important event. And to Canadians, let, my say, let us imagine ourselves creating a renaissance of our own in Canada, where we learn from the past, embrace the future, and above all, work together for a smarter, more caring world. Let me end with two of my favorite lines from Shaw, and so many of you have heard me say this so many times. It goes this way, some people see things as they are and wonder why. We dream of things that ought to be and ask why not. Thank you. Merci. Thank you, Your Excellency. Now, as we move to the summit's opening benchmark session and exploration of some very big ideas, let us first hear from an important public outreach partner, Lisa DeWild, Chief Executive Officer of TVO. TVO is the summit's presenting media partner. Lisa. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, this is just going to be an amazing week. On behalf of all of us who are here this afternoon from TVO, I want to add our greetings to the many leaders and leaders to be from government and from the scientific community. TVO is here today because we're committed to using media to help people understand our world. I think we're very aligned with the previous speaker. Simply put, we believe that the more engaged our citizens are in the big questions that are defining our society, the stronger our society will be. And that includes exploring the complex questions that are as fundamental to our future as the sustainable production, transmission, and storage of energy. We're delighted to be the presenting media sponsor for this unprecedented event. And we want to make this really ambitious discussion accessible across the province and around the world. 
Throughout the summit, the Agenda with Steve Pakin will present five nights with, the, with science's brightest minds, all from this beautiful theatre. It's part of a long-term partnership between TVO and Canada's Perimeter Institute, and it's all aimed at building scientific literacy. I'd like to close by offering my congratulations to PI and to the University of Waterloo's Waterloo Global Science Initiative. Uh, you're making this summit just such an inspiring week, and we thank you for that. Thank you very much, and thank you to all of our partners at TVO. We would like to note that a number of other media organizations will be on site this week uh, during the conference, including journalists from Nature, Scientific American, BBC Africa, ABC Australia, The Globe and Mail, and many other outlets. Some will be following the events online, such as MSNBC. So welcome to all of the participating media. We now move to our panel discussion and a further introduction to the many issues and opportunities that will be discussed at this conference. But if we wish to learn about technological ideas for a low carbon and more electrified future, how do we measure progress? That was a key question for summit organizers, particularly given the public outreach nature of the events. The answer was to set a baseline that boils down our global energy situation and then share some present and future benchmarks in the way we generate, distribute, and store electricity. <laughs> 